Paris in the 1950s was equal parts filthy and fabulous. The darkest days of World War II were over, and people like Christian Dior and Coco Chanel were crafting the future of fashion right there on the bombed out cobblestone streets. But conditions were pretty wretched. 20% of homes had no running water, and 50% lacked toilets. But Parisians were hopeful, and they wanted that Jetsons future they were promised in American magazines. Casimir Lubier, a salesman and amateur engineer, decided he was the man to give car lovers the future they deserved. So he designed the Arbel Symmetric. It looked like a murdered out Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, but was actually an 1800 pound fiberglass body tacked onto a wooden frame, powered by a very clever 45 horsepower hybrid motor. The Symmetric had only one pedal, so when you weren't accelerating, you were braking. It was a capable design that was totally ignored. So Casimir reworked it. He gave it an all new rubber block, shockless and springless suspension he dubbed Thermogum. He redid the interior with a washer fluid reservoir that topped itself off with rainwater and an ashtray that would empty itself onto the street. He even turned the frame into a gas tank. But Casimir's concept car insanity didn't end there. He yanked out the hybrid powertrain and installed his self-designed Genestatum, a 40 kilowatt dual turbine rear mounted nuclear powerhouse. The motor burned nuclear waste stored in replaceable cartridges that needed to be replaced every five years. The few people who pre-ordered the Symmetric were told that the availability of the nuclear powered motor was entirely dependent on government approval. The government did not approve and the story of the Symmetric ended there. Why are concept cars so important? What madness fuels the creativity behind these amalgamations of fiberglass, clay, and sheet metal? What company took the idea of the concept car too far? Well, today on Past Gas, we're talking about concept cars through the years and just how they reflect all of our greatest hopes, dreams, and failures. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. Big thank you to Valvoline for sponsoring today's episode. You guys know that Valvoline has been a long time sponsor of Past Gas. Valvoline was the first motor oil brand, making them the original motor oil. That's right. Since their founding over 150 years ago, Valvoline and their scientists have been innovating, creating, and reinventing formulas. Valvoline's milestone innovations include the first high mileage oil, the first racing oil, and the first synthetic blend oil. Valvoline is also the world's number one supplier of EV battery fluids, offering tailored products to help extend vehicle range and efficiency. I want to talk to you guys about Valvoline's new extended protection full synthetic oil. It's their best oil ever. Their newest formula offers the ultimate protection designed to extend the life of your engine. Valvoline extended protection is specially formulated with dual defense additive technology, which combines an innovative additive booster with a fortified detergent system. So if you have an oil change coming up soon, make sure you get some Valvoline extended protection full synthetic for your car. I have Valvoline high mileage in there right now, but this new extended protection sounds like the way to go. So thank you very much Valvoline for sponsoring this episode. Be like us, put Valvoline in your car today. Big thanks to our sponsor this week, Current. You know, traditional banks can be really hard to work with. They're only open from like 8 to 4.30 for some reason when you're working, and they'll charge you fees for not having enough money in your account. What the heck's up with that? Well, that's where Current comes in. Current is the future of banking, where you can send, spend, save, and manage your money all from your phone. And right around now in the holidays, that's a real nice thing to have. Current's app and connected debit cards help you get a Ahead by giving you faster access to paychecks, fewer fees, and more flexibility. With a current premium account, members can get paid up to two days faster on direct deposits because some banks hold your money for 48 hours. That is an amazing feature. I know I'd want to get my money two days faster. And also, there's no overdraft fees up to $100, which means no more anxiety about getting declined when you swipe. For a limited time, we've partnered with Current to give away cash for the holidays. That's right, you heard me. Current is giving away $200 to 10 podcast listeners in the month of December. All you have to do is download the current app and enter code GAS during sign up before December 31st for a chance to win. Remember, that's GAS, G A S, during sign up. 
download the current app, sign up in less than two minutes and enter gas for a chance to win $200. No purchase is necessary to win and purchase won't increase chances of winning. Void where prohibited. Eligibility restrictions apply. Visit current.com slash gas for full terms and conditions. Thank you, Current, for sponsoring this episode. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC. Pursuant to a license from Visa USA Incorporated and can be used anywhere. Visa debit cards are accepted. Faster access to funds is based on comparison of traditional banking policies and deposit paper checks from employers and government agencies versus deposits made electronically. Direct deposit and earlier availability of funds is subject to payer support of the feature and timing of payers funding. Overdrive is available only on current premium accounts. Please refer to overdrive features, terms, and conditions. Eligibility requirements apply. I like an open concept car. So like <laughs> the kitchen, like the driver's seat and the dash, like no dashboard. Right. I just like the front seat and the back seats to just be like one area. Yeah. And there's room for like five property brothers. <laughs> But we're keeping the chimney. Yeah, we're going to make it a feature. We're going to make it a feature of the car. And then we're going to expose the beams. Yeah. Like expose frame rails. Oh, yeah. Well, you got to okay. expose the beams. They got good bones in that car. So we're, <laughs> yeah. not- we're taking the carpet out. There's no like carpet in this car either. There's like nice, like the original wood it's floors. Cement. Yeah. Oh, cement. Mm-hmm. Oh, so so every house kind of looks like uh, <laughs> a uh, West L.A coffee shop yeah and there's ship lap ship lap and some succulents in the corner no no trunk only gray cabinets <laughs> those gray wooden floors the gentrification floors <laughs> welcome to past gas everybody we are not a home show we are not a home design show yet not, not yet. yet i guess <laughs> what would a home decor show sound like uh, i guess we already Showed you. Yeah, uh, I am your host, Nolan Sykes. This Joined, week, we're talking about jams. Door jams, floor jams. <laughs> Lots to discuss. Uh, you That voice you just heard was my boy, Joe Weber. Sup, Wink Wink Nation. Stand by. Always standing by. Just always, always oh, in a holding pattern. I Okay, there's a, a rift going on right now. Um uh, Wink Wink Nation actually split into a couple different factions, and I don't like it at all. Um, currently, there's a rebellion going on with Blink Blink Republic. And oh, no. I just want to, this is a message to Blink Blink Republic. We share the same values. We do not need to split up. Let's unify. We have a stronger message together. <laughs> uh, is Blink Blink Republic... Is Travis Barker involved in that at all? Um, he can be. I got to talk to his manager. He's available. He doesn't, he's doing a lot of work right now. Our other host is the one and only, the incomparable James Pumphrey. Toot toot, baby, baby, toot toot. How <laughs> <laughs> what's up, guys? <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday. I'm feeling good. Hell yeah. I just ate a pickle for breakfast. Hell Ooh. yes. Calm that tummy. Mm-hmm. Dang, how we feeling this week, guys? We had, we had a, a special live show a few days ago. This will be like old news by the time you hear this, but it was quite the endeavor yeah, I feel. It was, did you guys like need ass. that whole day yesterday to um, recover, recuperate? I would have. Yeah, that would have been cool. But I uh, had to shoot some branded stuff. I shot one branded thing. I, w- I shot one ad. Uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, it was it was funny. I was like, man, why am I so stressed out? And then after the live show, I was like, oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was fun. You guys did amazing. And I think it got a great response and I think we should do more of that stuff. Yeah, it was a really good time. A lot of prep for that, but it worked out pretty awesome. Kind of took over my whole life for the last two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. But the team came together. We did it. Yeah, pretty amazing job by all the cast and crew. Um, If you haven't seen it by now, uh, I I still think it's live on our our YouTube channel. It's still up. You can go give it a watch. It's two hours long. (laughs) It's pretty long. But uh, worth watching, I think. It's pretty funny. We did some fun stuff that... Uh, and most importantly, we kicked Gordon Ramsay's ass in views. Yeah, we kicked the crap out of Gordon oh, Ramsay. Yeah. Gordon Ramsay had his own live show, and uh, our numbers crushed him. So, uh, Dear Gordon Ramsay, don't yell at your employees, you... <laughs> and also, 
You're not a YouTuber, bro. <laughs> yeah, stay off our turf. Just get off our turf. Go back to TV and making all your money, dude. Yeah, keep chopping. <laughs> keep chopping. Stay chopped. <laughs> Fellas, what are some concept cars that stick out in your mind? I think my favorite concept car is that Mitsubishi with the water hose. Oh, dude. My, oh, yeah. my favorite concept car has a water hose, too. I believe that's the Pontiac you're thinking of, James. Yes. Oh, yeah? Yeah. yeah. The beachcomber kind of thing. It's like a, yes. it was before yeah. the Aztec. That's mine. Yeah, that thing's yeah, pretty me rad. Too. I forget what it's called. That I think it's rules. A, I think it's called a Stinger. Yes, I think it's the Pontiac, Pontiac Stinger. Stinger. It's got two hoses, actually. It's got a removable boom box. It's got holes in the doors like the new Bronco. Uh-huh. Pretty sick. It's got wetsuit interior. Yeah. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it does. This is the best concept yeah, car of all time. I'm so man. happy we're on the same page. Yeah, that's this a great is like pick. Th- This is a car designed by like a fourth grader. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is like what the Ninja Turtles drive around in. <laughs> yeah. I think my favorite is the Dodge Tomahawk, which was a Dodge Viper engine that you basically rode on. It had four wheels. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember this. It was kind of like a motorcycle with four wheels. It's like that a makes Batman sense. motorcycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember seeing that in like Hot Rod Magazine when I was like, 10 and like thought yeah this is the future right here this is definitely gonna happen there's no way that this doesn't make it to market and by the time i'm 25 i'm gonna be rolling to work on a dodge tomahawk what could go wrong? how could they not make it how could they not make it <laughs> yeah it had a horizontal double fork in both the front and rear and you could you could ride it like a motorcycle because it like articulated like it would lean but it had four wheels very weird. Um, a close second for me is the Aston Martin Bulldog, uh, designed by none, none other than, uh, what's his name? <laughs> the Italian guy? Giorgetto Giorgio? Giorgetto Giorgio, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. This thing's very cool. Very wedge-like. Very Giorgio. It's, this is another thing, like, a fourth grader drew this. Like, the proportions are all super weird. Oh, it's, that's really cool. I think this is what became the Countach. The Countach or the Elan, the, or not the Elan, the Lotus uh, Esprit. Yes. 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 The Esprit is definitely uh, reminiscent of this. Yeah. Man, I this think is the, so cool. The concept I'm, I was most excited about and I'm potentially most disappointed that they didn't make was the Nismo IDX. Nismo. Oh, it was like oh, a yes. modern, it was like a modern 510. Yeah. Like, just oh, like a real yes. boxy. Oh, the front totally looks like a 510. Yeah, real boxy sports sedan. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I wish they made it. was so close to, like, being Damn. real. Yeah, if the if the economy was, a, like, at 1990 levels now, yeah. they probably would have built it. But, unfortunately, nobody wants to build fun cars. Okay, well, it's it, this isn't a financial podcast. This is a car podcast. This is a car podcast. This is a car podcast. So let's get into the cars. And this week, it's all about concept cars. <laughs> yes, it is. Before Parisian car dealers were designing nuclear whips, the Americans had already perfected the idea of the concept car. Way back in 1893, a man was born in Hollywood, California, that would change the face of the auto industry forever. Harley Earl started out life as the son of a legitimate horse-drawn carriage coach builder. As the 1800s became the 1900s, the senior Earl ditched the horses and started working on the newfangled horseless carriages before he launched Earl Automotive Works. The auto repair and customization shop was focused mostly on building cars for the movie industry. Eventually, Lawrence P. Fisher, the general manager of Cadillac at the time, ran across the young Harley Earl and watched him bend auto steel to his will, and he was amazed. He saw that Harley was using clay to form the new auto body designs and gave the kid a shot. He commissioned him to design the all-new 1927 LaSalle for Cadillac. LaSalle. Method Man's favorite car. (laughs) The LaSalle was so successful that the president of General Motors, Alfred P. Sloan, tapped into Harley's ideas and created an art and color division of GM, and he put Harley in charge of it. 
Up to this point, American car builders didn't waste a lot of time thinking about how cars looked or how they made you feel, because those were feelings, and people didn't want feelings. They wanted cars guided by functionality. The big wigs at GM sat back, probably smoking cigars or pipes, and watched Harley get to work. The engineers laughed at him behind his back, and they definitely would have called him flamboyant if anyone knew what that meant in 1925. Instead, they referred to the art and color division as the beauty parlor. For more than a decade, Harley fought a losing battle against the drab engineers. He tried to bring some light and color into their lives, but they weren't having it. But soon, Sloan had faith in the young designer, so he renamed art and color the styling section giving him back a little bit of clout with the engineers. We did a wheelhouse on car colors a while ago, and it it has to do with the economic situation at the time. And in the twenties, obviously it was going downhill. So you can see literally like in history, when cars became colorful is when the economy was prosperous. And when it's in a recession or whatever, they turn into these drab, like, earth tones and blacks and grays and stuff. Alongside Alfred P. Sloan, Harley came up with an idea that would rock the car world down to its leaf springs. They called it dynamic obsolescence behind closed doors, and in public referred to it as the New Year model. He came up with the idea of making incremental changes in the body styling. He would improve the car just a wee bit, enough to get those dollars through the doors. And today, every car manufacturer does this. But back in the day, Harley was a revolutionary. His ideas blessed GMs with high resale value and personality. He avoided dramatic change, so he didn't scare the normies away from his new designs. And it worked so well that Harley was given free reign to design new models. I'm a big fan of this guy's motorcycles. <laughs> this is not the same guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Joe, we are a educational, entertaining podcast. We can't be misleading people like that. Dude, it's the Joker's girlfriend, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In 1939, Harley got to work on his Pizza de la Resistance and changed the game forever. After some furious sketching and whipping and nay naying up a batch of his car making uh, clay, Harley rolled out. The Buick Y <laughs> <laughs> <Why> job. <laughs> the Buick Y job. Ooh. <laughs> Dude, this thing is sick. Have you guys ever got a Y job? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that. It's when you go like this with your hand, like make a Y. <laughs> <laughs> it's when you're getting up <laughs> and the person punches you in the tummy and you just go, why? <laughs> 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 it's the holiday season and you don't know what to get as a gift or stocking stuffer well today's sponsor manscaped has the tools to guarantee you win this year's stocking stuffer or white elephant competition manscaped is the leader in men's below the waist grooming and they have served more than four million men worldwide my math is correct. That's almost 8 million balls. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with code GAS20. Manscaped's best-selling product is the Performance Package 4.0, which is at the top of every man's wish list this year. Dude, if you don't want one of these things, you're missing out. The Lawnmower Body Hair Trimmer is the best trimmer on the market for your balls, butt, and body. And the Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer is just as good. They've also got a shampoo and body wash that I've been using for the past few weeks. I actually need to get more of the body wash because guess what? I've used all of it. Stinky guy. That's just what happens. But it smells really good and just has a really nice lather. I love it. The Manscaped Cologne. I also have been using that. That's like my travel one. And I really like the smell of that too. It smells sophisticated. Get the performance package now to receive two free gifts with it. The Manscaped Boxers, which I wore yesterday, and the Shed Travel Bag, which I also used during my Thanksgiving trip. Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com with code GAS20. Be the ballsiest gift giver ever this year with Manscaped. Thank you, Manscaped, for sponsoring this episode. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash past gas. Life is full of stressors. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have. Your life is probably stressful. I know that's true. It's the holidays. It's stressful. You know, being with your family is great, but man, uh... 
You start to learn where all your uh, neuroses come from, don't you? I know I do. Unload the stress and get it out. Talk to someone who's completely unbiased about your life, someone who isn't going to judge you or take sides on anything. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. I'm super happy that a service like BetterHelp exists. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Unload the stressors and get some unbiased feedback. You'd be pretty surprised at what you might gain from it. See if it's for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Past Gas by Donut Media listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash pastgas. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash pastgas. Thank you very much, BetterHelp, for sponsoring this episode. (laughs) <laughs> While the name was silly, in the aviation industry, uh, they referred to advanced prototypes with a Y designation. So Harley was just trying to be cool, like the plane guys. Okay. What wasn't silly uh, was that this was the first concept car ever made by a major manufacturer. They were all seeing the opportunities the Y job offered. <laughs> it wasn't just a fancy car that probably wouldn't get made. It was a testing platform for new ideas and a way to see what normal folks think. One problem in the industry is that makers spend a lot of time developing concepts in secret without getting feedback from the outside world. Prototypes and concept cars let the builders test out ideas, and if everyone laughs at them, they'll mothball it. (laughs) But if everyone falls in love with it, you'd see bits and bobs from the concept all over the new cars, from that manufacturer for the next few years. That's kind of what I'm hoping uh, Acura, I hope they take all this uh, criticism into action. I would not hold your breath. Uh, watch me. I'm going to hold my <laughs> breath for a long time. <laughs> At best, it's like months, probably years, even if they take it all. Just don't hold your breath. You'll die. I've done it for at least three minutes. I could do it for a couple years. <laughs> That's where the 1938 Y job came in hot. <laughs> this long black Buick was sexy. It had a pop open headlights. It had power locks and windows. It had wraparound bumpers and it even had Tesla esque flush door handles. So, how many of those touches made it to the 1939 lineup? None. But they would appear in one form or another over the next few decades on other Buicks. Hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this car, this Y job, Y job. Pretty sure this one, like best of sh- best in show at uh, Pebble Beach, the rich person's car show. Sometimes I wake up on Monday mornings and I'm like, ugh, Y job. <laughs> <laughs> the Buick Y job was a technical feat full of wild new gadgets that made people want to part with their paychecks. The idea of modern bells and whistles drove the post-World War I crowds wild. Just bonkers. This was only a few years after the World's Fairs were dropping inventions left and right onto people who barely had toilets and still had full-time jobs smelting iron ore and (laughs) scooping horse poop into furnaces. Quite the dichotomy there at the turn of the century. As the people of the 30s and 40s watched the space-age futuristic wonders explode out of these huge fairs, Car executives were listening. While it would be decades before the common man got his little hands on things like telephones, dishwashers, and zippers, the car execs learned that they could make serious cash dishing out a taste of that futuristic technology. The car version of the space race began as World War II came to an end. Harley Earl set up the perfect debut to the concept car idea with the Y job, and then he followed up by inventing... The car tail fin, which made 50s cars like the 1955 Bel Air and the late 50s Coupe de Ville's absolutely gorgeous and very spaceship-like. This out-of-the-world aesthetic captured the hearts and minds of Americans who were looking to turn their back on the Great Depression and two world wars that rocked the planet. And they also were just starting to get really good music, which made driving all that much better. The first real taste of what was to come was the 1951 GM LaSabra. Whoa. (laughs) LaSabre. While the LaSabre that eventually came out was kind of lame, the 51 variant was a freaking rocket ship, almost literally. 
Our old friend Harley birthed the LeSabre from his aviation obsessed brain, and a single glance will definitely confirm that. This thing looks so sick. It rocked a wraparound windshield, tail fins, and a very turbine looking nose that resembled a Nazi fighting jet. A Messerschmitt. This was the car that Harley took on for his daily after his 1938 wine job died. <laughs> The body was made of a combination of magnesium, aluminum, and fiberglass, making it a spiritual grandfather to the superleggeros of the future. A 215 cubic inch supercharged V8 put the ponies to the ground through a bizarre rear-mounted Buick Dynaflow automatic, and you could run it on regular gas or methanol. This is just like a, a fire waiting to happen. Oh my God. Yeah, dude, but this guy got so many Y jobs in this car. <laughs> the steering wheel's made of Tinder. <laughs> this thing's cool. Yeah, it's really nice. On top of the space age design, the LeSabre had a 12 volt electrical system. Most cars were still six volt back then. No one can attest to this. Mm -hmm. As well as a clever headlight system hidden behind the front jet intake looking grill. This car also had chassis mounted electric jacks. That's pretty sick. Well, what racing series uses uh, chassis mounted jacks? Uh, like a lot of the endurance racing cars, like yeah. uh, IMSA and like Le Mans. So they're not electric in those ones. They're or some of them might be, but some of them are also hydraulic. Like they just put an air hose on it, and like these little legs come down, and the car now you can take the tires off without having to use a jack. Dude, that's so that's so droid. It's, <laughs> that's pretty sick. Dude, that's mad droid, dude. The Saver never saw showroom floors, <laughs> but the tech stuffed into the chassis appeared in a long list of cars down the line, like the Buick Special and Skylark, Oldsmobile Cutlass and Jetfire, Pontiac Tempest and Le Mans, and ultimately in a plethora of British cars like the Range Rover, Triumphs, MGs, and Morgans. The aviation theme was a success. And everybody wanted in on it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to win. I'm going to get a Y job. <laughs> Give me a Y job. I make a plane into a car. In 1956, Pontiac took the whole aviation theme just a little too far with their Pontiac Firebird 2. This is the second of four prototypes that are basically just punning hard on the word Firebird, but they were pretty cool. The Firebird 2 didn't just look like a jet, it was powered by an actual jet engine, a Whirlfire GT304 that whipped up 200 horsepower at 35,000 RPM. What? The body was handcrafted from titanium and had a slew of insanely futuristic features like four-wheel independent suspension, a rear-view camera if you can believe it, and maybe the most important feature of all, gentlemen, four-zone air conditioning. The car even had an autonomous driving mode that would have definitely killed people and a two-way comm system that drivers could use to get directions and make hotel reservations. Wow. This 1956 Pontiac had OnStar 40 years early. <laughs> yeah, cool. Oh, that's cool. So it was just probably just like a phone that like called a hotline. Yeah. Do you guys think it's a bad idea to put like $10,000 of stock into OnStar right now? I think there's probably a better use of $10,000 than OnStar. I think OnStar is like on the precipice of something great right now, though. I think... Based on what? <laughs> well, you know, like you crash calling. Like how many other companies are doing crash calling right now? Dude, be, be like me. Put your whole nut in something safe. <laughs> invest invest in 1010-220. What's that? <laughs> You get cheaper calls oh. across the nation, <laughs> long distance calls. Just dial down the center with Win 800 ATT. Yeah, I think that makes sense because they're. I've seen them installing a lot more like pay phones on the street. Yeah, and 10 to 20. It's like not flashy. Yeah, but it's safe. I get that. I'm. I'm in. I'm gonna take out ten thousand dollars from my uh, Rivian stock and put it into that. Speaking of $10,000, Joe, have you got your forerunner back? Is that coming today? It's supposed to. Speaking it's supposed to come. Finger, fingers crossed. Um, this guy's doing a real wide job on me right now. So <laughs> trying to uh, 
put the heat under his butt and he told me, he promised me he, I would get it back before Thanksgiving. So I'm going to hold him to that. And if not, we'll uh, show up with some baseball bats. From the 1950s to the 1970s, concept cars just got more aerodynamic and more Jetson-like. Turbines and nuclear reactors start popping up in random Fords and Chevys. But by the 70s, car execs were back to guzzling their own Kool-Aid, and they just made every single concept car into a wedge. That was the thing back then. We love wedges. I love a wedge. Literally every concept car from Sketch to Clay was the same car we all drove when we were in kindergarten. Do you guys like a wedge salad? Yeah. I think it's pretty good, even though I'm not a big blue cheese fan. I'm a, yeah, I like a wedge salad. By the 1980s, the dream of that Jetsons future had been thoroughly crushed by mountains of cocaine, disco, the gas crisis, and Vietnam. It had gone from self-propelled maids and electric walnut openers to settling for just a vague feeling of what the future could be. Wall Street executives didn't care about freaking space. <laughs> they wanted a digital dash. One of the first concept cars of the 1980s was the Ford Probe 3. This was Ford's third shot at probe hood, and it was not very good. The first probe was a 70s wedge with pop-up headlights and a sad motor. The second was a bit more non-wedge and looked like a Lancia Prisma mixed with an 80s Lotus Elise with a sad motor. But the Probe 3 went above and beyond. It ditched the whole drivability factor of the Probe 1s and 2s and focused entirely on aerodynamics. But without just being a doorstop, the Probe 3 was a bubble of a car. It looked like a 90s Ford Taurus that just gave up and melted. And it sounded like a dust buster. All things you totally want in a new car. Through their glassy eyes, execs thought they had something amazing. And they sort of did. Even though the Probe 3 was a total jelly bean, <laughs> it's, it was hella aerodynamic in a way that those wedges never were, and Ford took those design cues and passed them down to their best-selling car ever, the Ford Taurus. This does look crazy. Let me describe the Probe 3 for the listener. The front end gives me major Geo Prism vibes in the front. Yep. The mid-side, like the mid-box, the middle box is pretty Taurus-like, mm -hmm. but then the rear uh, has like Fox body tail lights. it looks like. You know the ones that kind of look like window blinds? With like a Kazi wing on it. Yeah, it's got like two Kazi wings on the back and then a covered rear wheel. And like sort of like a fastback hatchback looking thing. It's very strange looking. The wheels are kind of cool though. I can see those being at, at like a Volkswagen show. Yeah. Looks like something you'd see in uh, Demolition Man. <laughs> That's just Demolition Man. <laughs> Yeah, bad. And that was such a weird line to end that movie on. I know. <laughs> but at the end of the day, that's just demolition, man. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know he still has the turtle from Rocky? Whoa, and it's like really? forty-six years old or something. Wow, I love Rocky. Sylvester Stallone is definitely a guy who's like way smarter than he comes off. Yeah. He wrote Rocky. Can you imagine him? He's like him at a typewriter. Reminds me of that meme with all oh, the yeah. strong guys like emailing each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, he's yeah, like yeah, typing yeah. with just his pointer fingers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Another big thank you to our sponsor this week, Valvoline Motor Oil. You know them. They're the original motor oil. If you've already got Valvoline oil in your car, you need some Xerox by Valvoline coolant in there as well. Whether it's time to top off or do a complete system flush, Xerox by Valvoline is made specifically for your exact make and model. Xerox from Valvoline is the number one selling OEM approved coolant brand that's been proven to maximize engine life. Xerox provides better protection against the four main causes of cooling system failure, which is the leading cause of engine breakdown. When you see someone on the side of the road with a bunch of steam coming out of their hood, that means their cooling system has failed, and uh, that's never a good time. Xerox ensures ideal corrosion protection versus generic antifreeze, and their patented formulas contain the highest quality additive packages in the country. 
And now you can get $2 off any gallon of Xerox at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts. So check that out. Get some Xerox for your car. Get some Valvoline for your car. I know I got to put some Xerox in there. I haven't done a coolant flush in a while. And you know, my car is getting a little older. I want to keep the car for a while. So I got to get Xerox in my car. You can too. Get Valvoline wherever you get your motor oil. Get some Xerox in there and uh, you'll be set, man. Valvoline, thank you very much for sponsoring this episode. Hey, thanks to this week's sponsor, Current. You know, it's the holidays right now, and it can be very difficult to keep track of all your spending this time of year. And that's where our sponsor this week, Current, comes into the picture. Current is the future of banking, where you can send, spend, save, and manage your money all from your phone. No more long lines at the bank, no more weird bank hours. Why do they close at five? With a Current Premium account, you can get paid up to two days faster with direct deposits, and they don't have overdraft fees up to $100, which is awesome. I love banking from my phone, and with Current, you will too. For a limited time, we've partnered with Current to give away cash for the holidays. That's right, Current is giving away $200 to 10 podcast listeners in the month of December. All you have to do is download the Current app and enter code GAS during sign up before December 31st for a chance to win. Remember, that's GAS during sign up. Download the Current app, sign up in less than two minutes and enter GAS for a chance to win $200. No purchase is necessary to win. Purchase won't increase the chance of winning. Void where prohibited. Eligibility restrictions apply. Visit current.com slash gas for full terms and conditions. Thank you, Current, for sponsoring this episode. Current is a financial technology company, not a bank. Banking services provided by and Visa debit card issued by Choice Financial Group, member FDIC. Pursuant to a license from Visa USA Incorporated, and can be used anywhere. Visa debit cards are accepted. Faster access to funds is based on comparison of traditional banking policies and deposit paper checks from employers and government agencies versus deposits made electronically. Direct deposit and earlier availability of funds is subject to payer support of the feature and timing of payers funding. Overdrive is available only on current premium accounts. Please refer to overdrive features, terms, and conditions. Eligibility requirements apply. If you listen to our Lee I. Cook episode, you know that minivans were the ultimate hotness of the 1980s. While European families were cramming their kids into Renault sport wagons, Americans said, no thank you, and turned their backs on short cars. <laughs> they wanted headroom. They wanted Star Trek-inspired shuttle lookalikes powered by motors that said goodbye to the oil crisis and hello to the future. The Transport minivan relaunched Pontiac's dead concept car team after 10 years of twiddling their thumbs. This thing actually, the concept looks sick. In actuality, they were all fired, but they hired new people and those people knocked it out of the park with this speedy aero kitty holler spinny arrow kitty holler that's not bad you can see where the eventual pontiac minivan came from because i bet that thing gets so <laughs> hot inside oh yeah it's a <laughs> oh bubble. yeah it's got a huge uh windshield uh it's like a greenhouse kind of thing yeah lots of glass really warm also it's got a murderer driving it renault <laughs> yeah, yeah does john wayne gacy it looks like the renault east space Mm-hmm, that super, the super van. Yeah. It also looks like the Star Trek landing shuttle. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes King. Uh, this, yes. Minivan, this minivan featured a huge gull wing door. And there's on a one murderer side. driving it. <laughs> it had a gull wing door on one side. Sorry, they, I forgot that this is an audio format for all our listeners. We're looking at a picture of this thing. And for some reason, there's a guy who's very obviously a murderer driving it. He's got like a. Members only jacket with a little bit Leather, of blood splatter. Members only jacket. <laughs> Had a huge gold wing door on one side, a heads up display, a computer to book travel reservations. Had a backup camera and even an Nintendo Entertainment System, so the little ones Ooh. in the back could crush each other at Excite Bike and not bother old mom and dad. Don't bother old mom and dad. Mom and dad were busy enjoying the Turbo V6 that put out 235 horsepower to the pavement. That's more than 50 more horsepower than the Corvette of that year. Hell yeah, dude. This thing rocks. I wonder if that was the related to like the GNX motor. Because that was a turbo V6 that put out around 235. It's possible, Joe. It's possible. Sadly, though, Joe. Joe, I think you've cracked the case. When the transport finally got to dealers, it was 1990 and everyone called it a dust buster that didn't do that well, especially with SUVs starting to be a thing you could haul kids have tons of space and look cool but they're kind of like if cargo pants were a car the actual pontiac minivan that came out looks nothing like this it sucks it looks like a catfish it's very ugly unfortunately 
But back in the 80s, vans were still doing well. Their sci-fi looks were winning over moms everywhere who just wanted to connect with their teenage sons. And what better way to make a mom cool than add a truck to that minivan? The GMC Centaur was a half minivan, half truck that looks like a stretched out, half melted VW Type 2 pickup. The massive interior had two bucket seats and a huge bench in the back. It was about the size of standard 80s sedan interior. This reverse mullet was party in the front, all business in the back, with a 2,000 pound pickup bed and 5,000 pound towing capacity. So this is Max Max's dream car right here. They actually made a couple of these GMC Centaurs and it looks like a sperm. <laughs> I think it's a full time or full sized Ram van in the front with a huge cab and then just a pickup bed. It's weird as hell. They also make flatbed versions with like a fifth wheel. Hmm. Interesting. You can still find them though. They're like a couple thousand bucks. It looks like a slipper. It does. Yeah. This is a slipper, like a classic, like cartoon slipper. It looks like Homer Simpson's slippers. It also looks like a sperm. <laughs> <laughs> While the 80s concept cars were all digital dashes and laser beams, the car execs of the early 90s put away the cocaine and started to get serious. They'd survived oil embargoes and restrictive emission standards, and cars were starting to get good again. The concept cars of the 50s imagined a world that could be, but by the 90s, we had some solid car tech happening, and they were fun to drive again. So, executives sat around the table, probably, and started brainstorming about the future of cars. The big three, being quite self-congratulatory, looked back at all their past successes and decided it was time to play their greatest hits all over again. No more digital dashes, no more door sill lighting, no more clever transmissions or aero lines. It was time for some retro. The 90s saw the birth of resto modding. People were grabbing up old cars and shoving brand new crate motors under the hoods, making something fast, fun, and fancy. Everybody loved these things except the purists, but they hate everything that isn't numbers matching. The whole shebang started off with the early 90s Viper that promised a big fuel-injected V10 crammed into a sleek and sensuous car that looked like the roadsters of the past, but with tons more big boy energy. It was old school, but it was also new, and it flew. The Viper made 400 ponies, twice that of the Mustang that year, and more torque than two 1990 F-150s strapped together. Wow. The Viper was embraced instantly by everyone from poster-collecting fanboys to critics to Kelsey Grammer. It was such a big success that people wanted more. Execs at Chrysler grabbed Tom Gale, the man who designed the insane Viper concept, and they turned him loose to design whatever he wanted. I think um, this is what kicked off that uh you know like the pt cruiser the prowler even the new beetle gale emerged from his designatorium with crazy scribbles resembling a hot rod from the 1950s he dubbed the project the prowler there we go <laughs> this beast had a super high belt line along with a steeply raked windshield and open front wheels the prowler sported a 20 inch wheel in the back which was bonkers compared to the standard 15-inch steelies that came on almost every car of the day. You could also get it in almost any color you wanted, as long as those colors were yellow, black, or red. There was even a matching trailer option to make it look like the car had a second butt. That's strange. The crowd went wild, and the bean counters loved it too, because the MSRP was almost $40,000. That's 90s money too, that's pretty expensive. Then they got creative with sourcing parts. It used the heart and transmission of the Eagle Vision and the rack and pinion of the Dodge Caravan. With the high price and 40% of the car being sourced from the parts bin, it seemed like a win-win. But Plymouth made a fatal mistake. They only offered the retro sports car in automatic. So Go Fast fans all over collectively sighed and spent their money on Mustangs. At the end of the day, they only sold 11,702 Prowlers. I don't think that was the biggest failure. Like... It was made for old people who buy automatic transmissions. It was the suspension was tuned really soft for old people. It was just made for boomers. Yeah. I mean, like who else is going to be buying a, a car that looks like a hot rod from the 50s? Yuri from the straight pipes. Yuri from the straight pipes has one of these, but that's because that's like a more ironic thing for no, him. No, he just he was able to buy his dream car and that was like his dream car when he was a kid. 
my music teacher in elementary school, Mr. Gary, uh, he had a poster of the Prowler on his <laughs> on his wall in the music room, and he taped he taped his photo over the driver <laughs> in the picture. Classic, Mr. Gary. It was really funny. Mr. Gary was great. That's pathetic. <laughs> hey man, <laughs> Mr. Gary had a gr- had an impact on a lot of kids' lives. Very positive. I hope hey, still, stick still to around. having an impact on kids' futures, yeah, idiot. Yeah, stick to me- <laughs> stick to mentor and stick to. <laughs> he was very pathetic. I hope he's. I hope he's still around. Hey, Mr. Gary, I didn't even go to college. I could buy a prowler. Yeah, but then you'd be driving a prowler. I love Mr. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Gary. I don't think you're a good man. He's a good man. I think you're great. The whole retro trend with new bits and bobs is still going strong. Hyundai recently dropped an EV concept resto mod thing based on one of their early uh, models, but totally outfitted with modern electric car drivetrain. It's super awesome. I love it. While the retro concept car started out a bit goofy in the early 90s, they're heading in a pretty awesome direction with car makers staring at the muscle car era instead of the hot rod era. While an electric 51 Mercury would be pretty badass, a silent 1971 Chevelle SS with sub-2 0-60 times would instantly empty wallets. Overall, concept cars have been a direct reflection of who we really are as people throughout time. From primitive goons trying to improve the speed of a single horse to total nerds breaking records with 0-60 to times, we just want the next best thing. And while that next best thing used to be the future, now we're looking for sequels to our favorite hits, and they better be good. Like The Matrix Resurrections. I hope that's good. I hope it's good. I want to, I want to, I hope that guy who eats the steak comes back. <laughs> uh, I heard that the guy Joey who Pants, eats the steak. Joey Pants, baby. Joey Pants yeah, Joey Pants is played by Timothy Chalamet now. <laughs> I like Tim Chalamet. I'm I'm on board. Me too, bro. I'm on the Tim train. Joey Pants, big fan of the podcast. Joey Pants. Joey Pants, shout star number one fan. We appreciate your support. Stop coming to the office. <laughs> we got uh, work to do. We're just trying to get it done, bud. All right. Well, that is the episode. But we've got a letter from Kamal. Kamal writes, greetings. I'm a huge fan of your show. I'm a South African born New Zealander, which is an interesting mix of car cultures. I bet your accent is hard to reproduce. (laughs) The South African in me loves old BMWs. The Kiwi bit of me loves drifting and rally. So hopefully soon I'll be doing a Zach Job and building an E36. Go for it, man. Great car. Really good car. I just want to say thank you for the amazing content you have been relentlessly putting out. Definitely helped keep me sane and entertained during lockdown last year. You are welcome. To the juicy bit. Spinning or gesheshe is a huge part of South African culture. From Wikipedia, quote, spinning is a South African motorsport that involves driving cars at speeds in circles and performing stunts in and out of the car. It originated in Soweto in the late 1980s and was performed as a funeral ritual in which a stolen car Whoa. was spun around to honor the deceased. Oh, hell yeah. It is now a recognized motorsport. I did not know that part of it. And I'm sorry if I completely butchered the pronunciation. Kamal writes on, I went to South Africa in 2019 and went to so- Soweto to these events. It was amazing to watch old BMWs with souped up and even swapped engines designed specifically for this form of street ballet. The culture is rich, and I think that Pascal should do an episode about it and the context from which it was conceived. Warmest regards, Kamal. I think that's super cool. There's a, that um, young girl that was on Hyperdrive uh-huh. that was part of this culture, and she killed it. And I would love to just, like, interview her. <laughs> for any reason or just, like, for your life? I'm just inter- Like, it's such a foreign culture to me that I would love to just, like pick her brain about it and I, di- I didn't even know that like you could find these old cheap like three series down there 
Yeah, our buddy, our buddy, our good friend, Aaron Parker, went to a uh, spinning thing when he went to South Africa with Mad Mike Wadette. And he said it was a pretty gnarly little scene there. So yeah, I'd love to love to do that. Yeah. If you would like to contact us, hit up. <laughs> if you'd like to contact <laughs> if like to, us. If you'd like to contact us, uh, email at us at passgas at donutmedia.com. And maybe we'll read your email on air. That was a good episode, guys. Uh, follow the boys. Follow my men at James Pumphrey, at Joe G. Weber. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. J. Sykes. Love you guys. Later. Peace. Be kind. See you next time.